Copyright in these lectures is either owned by the ANU or a third party who has licensed the ANU to use it. Students may use the recording for personal study only. No lecture may be communicated online, copied or shared without the prior permission of the ANU. Hi everyone. So today we're moving into our alternative assets. Now what we're going to do today is we're going to start with an overview of what alternative assets are. Now doing that is a bit difficult because even in this course think about the different alternative assets that we're going to do. Right? We're going to look at property, we're going to look at infrastructure, hedge funds, private equity, commodities. Now these are quite different asset classes. I mean, property and infrastructure do have a lot of similarities, and we're going to talk about that today. But hedge funds and commodities will behave in very different ways. Hedge fund and private equity returns have some similarities, but also a large amount of differences. I mean, a hedge fund, private equity is always investing in companies that are not publicly listed. Hedge funds are sometimes investing in equity, but it's publicly listed equity, or it could be investing in fixed income. It could be investing in countries across the world in different strategies at different times, going long and short, go, uh, taking on leverage and trading in derivatives. So again, fixed e uh, sorry, hedge funds is going to behave very differently to the other asset classes that we look at. So when, when I say I'm going to give you a, a definition of what alternatives are, what we actually do is give you a definition of what alternatives are not. In other words, anything that isn't public equity or public fixed income can be seen as an alternative asset class. Which means that when we look at the general attributes of alternatives, it's really important to remember that an attribute won't necessarily apply to every different alternative asset class. And I'll take you through that as we go. But what I wanted to start off today by saying is don't assume that all alternative assets are going to behave in the same way. Because what we're going to learn today is even in infrastructure, in a single asset class, different infrastructure projects can behave in very different ways and have very different risks involved. Now, we're going to go through five different alternative asset classes and we've only got two weeks in which to do it. There's only 12 weeks in the semester, there's only so much we can cover. The reason that we cover five alternatives in two weeks whereas we give a whole week to equity and a whole week to fixed income, reflects the general weights that they have in the portfolios. Okay? Alternatives are growing in popularity, but they're still in the minority when it comes to asset allocation. Some alternatives are really useful, but you don't often see super funds with a 60% weight in alternative asset classes. Can anyone give me a potential reason as to why we don't have large weightings in alternative asset classes? Risk access, they're two big ones. So for example, let's take hedge funds. Right? Individual uh, investors that are not high net worth individuals can't even invest in hedge funds because of some of the risks involved. Access is extremely difficult in certain alternative asset classes. Right? Take private equity. You guys are private equity managers and you are going to raise a $500 million fund. Now there are two ways in which you could do it. You could raise 100 million each from five investors, or you could raise a million dollars each from 500 different investors. Now, once you've got these investors, remember, you need to organize getting money from them, as you see the investments, distributing money back. There's always going to be the people that are on the phone all the time, wondering what you're doing with their money, what's happening with the private equity investments. You've got more administration, more reporting. So what would you guys rather? Would you rather have five investors to deal with or 500? Five. five, right? So what tends to happen with private equity is that, first of all, they want large investors, not small ones, because that means less investors to deal with. Second of all, they like to deal with existing clients because they know that they're not going to be difficult. They know that they are reliable in order the listed partners giving the general partner their money. We'll look at a lot of this next week. And they also love big names, right? Now, let's say that you guys have 100 million to invest, 
and you're considering a particular private equity fund, but you're not really sure. If the general partner comes in and says, Warren Buffett has just given me some money, that sounds pretty good, right? I mean, if that guy's going to invest in the fund, chances are there's something good about the fund. If they come in and say, Anna von Reibnitz has given me their money, I mean, who cares? I don't know what I'm doing. I barely invest my own money. It's not impressive. You guys know me. Anyone else would be like, huh, what? <laughs> who cares? So think about access, right? You, want to get, you know that there's a good private equity manager out there. You want to invest in a private equity fund that they raise. Well, you've got to have a huge amount of money. It helps to have a big name and it helps to have an existing deal with them, an existing investment in one of their prior funds, which makes accessing them as a new investor, a new small retail investor, difficult. Okay, so we've got risk, we've got access. Any other challenges that you might think of? Sorry? Understanding them, that's right. We know a lot about the public equity markets. We know quite a lot about fixed income markets. We learn about the attributes of alternative assets. But when you want to analyse a specific alternative asset, they're not very transparent. I mean, hedge funds don't need to report their strategies. So let's say that you are investing in a global macro hedge fund and you want to hedge away your currency risk. Well, first of all, they're probably denominated in US dollars. So OK, you can hedge your USD. But they're investing all around the world. You might know, not know what countries they're investing in because they don't need to tell you. Even if they tell you, they might not tell you whether you're hedging the currency. Sorry, whether they're hedging the currency risk. If they're hedging and you hedge, you've just undone the hedge. Right? So it's harder to understand what some of these asset classes are doing because they're a lot less transparent. And there's one other massive, well, there's several, we'll go through them, but another massive issue with alternative assets that isn't an issue with public equity and to an extent fixed income. Can anyone think what it might be? illiquidity, right? With the exception of commodity and REITs, alternatives are very illiquid. So one of the first things we're going to be doing today is talking about the challenges involved. I'm not saying don't invest in alternative assets. A small weight in them is a very valuable addition to your portfolio. It's a great diversifier. Uh, things like real estate can help you hedge against inflation. If you have certain uh, investment strategies like non-core property, like hedge funds, like private equity, a good manager will add a lot of excess return to your portfolio. But it's very important to understand the challenges when you recommend that investment. So when it comes to your assignment, I would be a little sad if you didn't recommend alternative assets at all, right, for Abigail and Robert. They're very useful. And they've actually said in the assignment they're looking to expand beyond the traditional asset classes they're in, I think. I think I wrote that. But remember, if you're going to have a large weight in alternatives, you need to consider that that means big time challenges that are involved. And even if you rec rec recommend a small alternatives weight, you're going to have to talk about how to implement the investment. So a lot of the arguments we're going to use with alternatives about watch out for illiquidity, manager selection is important, they're the type of things that you might want to draw on when it comes to the assignment. By the way, uh, Sort of related to the assignment, I'm starting to get some really good questions about the assignment in my consultations and via email. I'm incorporating them into the workshops. I'm really pleased to see that you guys are getting on top of it early. When it comes to tomorrow's consultation, I've got a four o'clock meeting. So tomorrow's consult isn't three to five, it's three to four. So please do keep that in mind. If you tend to come in the second hour, come in the first because I won't be there from four o'clock onwards. If I, I'm sure I'll be able to see everyone. I'm not getting that many people in my consults yet. Uh, but if, it, if I run out of time, I'll arrange a time uh, to see you later in the week, or you can send me an email, we'll figure it out. But yeah, for this week only, my consult's three to four. All right, so in terms of what we're gonna look at today, we're gonna talk about what alternative assets are, or more specifically, what they're not and what's different about them when it comes to comparing them to our traditional asset classes and when it comes to comparing them with each other. We're going to look at the challenges and alternatives and we're going to look at our first two alternative asset classes, which is property and infrastructure. Now property, if you think about your assignment, your shoot work, we talk about two different types. What are they? Listed and 
unlisted or direct. So remember, unlisted property and direct property are the same thing. And then there is also, separately, there is listed property. We're going to learn that there are some similarities, but also some differences between them that mean it's sometimes quite useful to combine them together in your asset allocation. You don't need to pick one or the other, you can pick both. And we're also going to look at infrastructure. Now, infrastructure, we're going to take a slightly different method in understanding the asset classes compared to the other ones that we look at in the course. Infrastructure has a lot of parallels with property, and we're going to talk about what those are. But the main thing we're going to focus on with infrastructure is the fact that people tend to take a very rose-tinted glasses view of this asset class. Particularly in superannuation, people love and are looking to increase their infrastructure weightings. Can anyone think why super would be so fond of infrastructure? Long time frame, right? If you have uh, people that are new to the workforce, have a long time to retirement, there aren't a lot of asset classes that have a 40-year time span. Equities are technically assumed to last forever, but they might be taken over in a decade. That's fine. You can still think of equities as a long-term asset class, but it doesn't tend to be a long-term investment strategy when you're trying to outperform, right? If you think about a lot of the active investment strategies, you're constantly changing and uh, turning over your portfolio. An infrastructure, a single infrastructure strategy or project might be existing for 100 years. A lot of them exist for at least 50. So the long time frame of infrastructure makes, makes it a good diversifier for the other long-term investment in your portfolio, which is equities. And arguably, well, it's not easier to invest in infrastructure by a long shot, but it is lower turnover. So people tend to love the idea of infrastructure, and they always cite the success stories. You know, they think about your classic popular toll roads, and they think, all right, it's expensive up front, but it's steady cash flows because you have tolls, right, user pay revenue streams, there's very little operating cost once you get started, most of them are natural monopolies, so that means that the, the uh, cash flows have safety attached to them, they provide inflation hedges, all of these really great things, and they are true for good infrastructure projects. Bad infrastructure projects have lost people a huge amount of money. And I gave an example probably in week one of the Cross City Tunnel in Sydney, and that's a good example. Compare the, something like the Cross City Tunnel to the M5, right? I mean, you've got one road, a toll road, that people regularly use because they don't have an alternative, right? You can't really get to Sydney without paying the toll on the M5. Or if you can, please email me and tell me how to do it because I drive up every month and I'm always paying that toll. Cross City Tunnel, it's really easy to go around it, right? So it turns out that most of the time when I go through the Cross City Tunnel, it's quick because no one's using it, but because no one's using it, you're not getting a good user pay revenue stream because there are alternative options available. People don't like to pay for their infrastructure. They should because roads are valuable, but we get annoyed when we have to pay a toll all the time. Right? So it's really important to consider that not all infrastructure is safe. Not all infrastructure is profitable. You need to pick your projects very carefully. So we start by saying this is the archetypal view that everyone, of why everyone loves the idea of infrastructure. And then we say this is how the reality can differ from that view. I love infrastructure, by the way. It actually is one of my favorite asset classes. It's an area I've spent some time um, on in industry. And I think it's great. But I just don't think people should look at it blindly and assume it's going to be a good investment just because it's infrastructure. All right, so remember, we say that alternative assets uh, is essentially anything that isn't the two asset classes that we've already looked at in the course. So anything that isn't listed equity or fixed income. Now, this week, we look at property and infrastructure. Next week, we have a very busy week. We look at hedge funds, private equity, and commodities. In your tutorial in a few weeks, you're going to look at inflation-linked bonds. Now, some people will consider that within their fixed income weight, and I, I tend to be one of those. I tend to think of inflation-linked bonds as fixed income. Others will group it as part of their alternative asset class. In my view, it doesn't matter. You can consider it an alternative if you want. You can consider it part of fixed income if you like. Um, the only thing is, if you ever are given a client that tells you to view it a certain way, you should be consistent with that view. Right? But uh, ultimately, 
I think it shares more attributes with fixed income than with alternatives, which is why I tend to see it as a fixed income investment. There's also a bunch of things that we don't look at in the course. There's forestry. I have a good friend that actually is running a forestry fund uh, in Singapore, and he just thinks it's the bee's knees. He loves it. He came from infrastructure, and he thinks it's fascinating, and it's an area that not a lot of people are in yet. Uh, there's residential property, providing an institution can invest in it. There's life settlements. Has any, have you guys looked at life settlements at all in any of your courses? Maybe if you've done actuarial, I don't know. I mean, if you have life insurance, you're paying premiums throughout your life, and then if you pass away, providing it fits certain conditions, your family will get a big payout. But you obviously don't get that payout because you're dead, right? <laughs> Hate to say, but you are. So what life settlements are is it's a way of cashing out of your life insurance so that you do get some money while you're alive. You don't get as much as what your family would had you passed away, but you do access it during your own life. So that's, we don't look at it in the course, but that's another possible alternative. Uh, we did look briefly at catastrophe insurance. What, inv what um, investment did we look at in an earlier week that had to do with catastrophe insurance? It was week five. Cat bonds, right? Remember, cat bonds is a way of essentially insurers passing on the risk of a catastrophe uh, to investors. And if you buy a cat bond, you get a regular series of fairly high coupon payments. But if the catastrophe occurs, you forfeit the right to any remaining repayments. So we looked at that in week five. Uh, another thing we don't look at is volatility or VIX uh, contracts. Uh, VIX tracks the implied volatility of the S&P 500. Collectibles is a really uh, increasingly popular alternative asset class. And this is one of my own personal favorites because I have a massive shopping problem and I love pretty things. So I've always spent a lot of money on things like art and wine. Now, unfortunately, I drink the wine, so that's not a good investment for me. But art, if it's the right type of art, has shown to have really good returns that actually have low correlation with your traditional asset classes. I tend to love about 100-year-old lithographs. Unfortunately, that's not a great investment in terms of their returns. But there is an asset class that is very particular to Australia that has very strong returns and they're growing through time. Can anyone think about what type of art that might be? Indigenous, yeah. Aboriginal art is getting really strong returns, particularly if it's from certain regions and by certain artists. So the nice thing about that is you're spending money to look at something beautiful, but you're investing at the same time. And I'm not personally into stamp collecting, although I do know people that are. I don't get it myself, but they love it. And again, you can get great returns from if you have some rare stamps as well. And essentially anything that isn't, remember, the two traditionals could be considered an alternative. That's not an exhaustive list. OK, so you've got such a range of different alternative asset classes. What we have here is some of their attributes and some of the ways in which they differ from your public equity and fixed income. And before I go through them, just let me say, please don't learn the left without the right. Because remember what I said at the beginning, you've got so many different alternative asset classes, they're not all gonna share the same attributes and features. Okay, so yes, a very common attribute is illiquidity and higher transaction costs, but it doesn't apply to every different alternative asset class. Commodities, for example, can be very liquid and can be very cheap to transact. So learn the whole row, or understand, I should say, the whole row um, when, you, when it comes to your revision. So we've actually spoken about a lot of these uh, at the beginning, but the first one that everyone, uh, that tends to be one of the biggest issues with alternatives is most of them are far less liquid than your traditional asset classes, and they have higher transaction costs. Uh, when we talk about transaction costs, what t what's the first thing that you'd think of when I say an asset is illiquid? What type of transaction cost are we talking? Uh, okay, that's a good one. A liquidity premium. So, uh, well, liquidity pre premium is an additional return you should get given the risk. So. Uh, illiquidity brings a risk, and because it brings a risk that you might not be able to sell the asset, or another one that I'm going to get to in a moment, 
you should get a higher return to compensate. You don't always. Unlisted property, you'd expect to have quite a high illiquidity premium. It doesn't seem to in reality. If you're not getting a what we call a perm in illiquidity, what are you getting? A haircut, and that's another one, right? You're going to have, if you're selling, you'll have to sell at a discount. If you're buying, you'll have to pay a premium. So they're the typical um, costs associated with illiquidity. When it comes to hedge funds, which I'll get to in a moment, there's actually multiple layers of illiquidity costs. Another one is when it comes to things like hedge funds and private equity, when, I, uh, when it comes to fees, not only uh, is potentially it hard to sell a private equity investment, but you tend to have both, a, well, you do have a management and a performance fee, which makes it more expensive as well. So high fees can be because of illiquidity and it can be because of the actual fee structure to invest in these funds. But, okay, if we stick with illiquidity and transaction costs, unlisted property and unlisted infrastructure are quite a liquid. So when you sell them, you will have to take a haircut in a lot of cases. Private equity, when it comes to cashing out of a private equity investment, there is a secondary market, but there aren't a lot of people in it. It isn't a liquid market. So you tend to have to take a discount to net asset value if you want to cash out of your private equity investment. Hedge funds, there is a double layer of illiquidity, and that brings in costs associated. The first, well, I'll start with the second because that's a bit of, that's more obvious. The second is that the assets a hedge fund will invest in might be illiquid themselves. So something like a long short hedge fund or a global macro strategy, those assets tend to be liquid. But if you're a hedge fund dealing in distressed debt or emerging markets, then the actual investments will have illiquidity issues attached. If you come back to the end investor le uh, level, not only might your manager be investing in illiquid assets, but the actual act of investing in a hedge fund creates illiquidity because of what we call redemption restrictions. Can someone tell me what is a redemption in a hedge fund? Withdrawing your money. You've given your money to a manager, now you want to take it back. Now, mutual funds don't tend to have this. Hedge funds do. And people like to say it's because they're greedy. And sometimes, in the case of Gates, which I'll come to in a moment, there is an argument that says that. But you've got to remember, if you're a hedge fund manager, you're typically taking a complicated strategy, often betting on convergence, right? You might buy something underpriced, sell something overpriced. It's rarely arbitrage, so you have to wait for the assets to converge. So why would you not want investors suddenly withdrawing money without any notice? Right? You're, you're betting on a convergence trade. Suddenly investors want their money out. What's, what's the issue? What's the potential risk here? It happened to long-term capital management. Yeah. Everyone wants to withdraw their money at once. You don't have enough cash. And I'll, next, uh, next week, we're going to look at the fact that hedge funds actually use cash as collateral. You don't have enough cash to pay it out. So you need to liquidate your convergence trades before they've converged, right? Because you are waiting for them to come together. If suddenly you need to liquidate the trades before they've come together, you've, you don't actually have a profit. And if they've diverged, you might have actually made a loss. That might uh, trigger more redemption requests and things can get bad quite fast, as it did for long-term capital management. Okay, so because these strategies are quite complex and they rely on time, a lot, not always, but most strategies rely on time for the profit to be realised, hedge fund managers don't want people just coming and going, you know what, change my mind, give me my money back. So they do a few different things to stop this happening. The first thing is they put in redemption fees. It's as obvious as it sounds. You want your money back, you're going to need to pay a fee to do so. If anyone has a fixed interest rate mortgage, it's a similar argument, right? If you want to get out of your fixed interest rate mortgage early, you'll have to pay a fee. You want your money back from a hedge fund manager, you've got to pay the fee. The next one is a redemption window. Does anyone know what a redemption window is? It's a, yeah, you've got to wait a period of time, right? So you, you go to the manager, you say, I want my money back. And they say, that's great, wait till the next window. That might be the end of the quarter. It might be the end of the year, right? And it might be that you ask for your money back in March and you've got to wait till December. And again, that gives the manager time to start to plan how they're going to, uh, which strategies will be ready to exit 
before they need to satisfy their redemption requests. They can plan in advance and therefore try to avoid having to liquidate strategies that haven't profited at that point in time. The last one is gates. Now, gates can be quite nasty. They're, they're essentially like a portcullis that comes down and traps the money within the fund. And it happened quite a bit in the GFC. Gates came down and money actually stayed trapped for years. If a hedge fund gate is imposed, there's no fee and no window that will enable you to get your money out. You need to wait until the gate is lifted again. The argument is it again gives them time to plan to figure out how to uh, maximise the profit from all their strategies. But the reality is it tends to happen when the market is at its worst and people need access to their money. And if a gate's down, they can't get it. So with hedge funds, even, even if it's a long, short equity hedge fund that's dealing in really uh, liquid asset classes, the very fact that there's redemption restrictions can make a hedge fund investment less liquid than it seems. So that's one. Another is appraisal valuations. So unlisted property, unlisted infrastructure, private equity, anything that isn't listed will have appraisal valuations. And the reason is that if it isn't listed, there's not a typical way to record its price. And it's also not traded very often because it's not easy to trade. I mean, if you had, think about it, all right. Let's say that you're going to Monica. I'm guessing that most of you have been to Monica shops. You know that there is that shop front opposite the petrol station, if this ring a bell, and it's been empty for ages. And every so often, there'll be a business that comes in and it typically doesn't last very long and it goes back to being empty. Right? For some reason, there's something about that corner that means it's really hard for businesses to be profitable there. I don't know why, but as long as I've been around, there hasn't been a, a long-standing business in that area. So it's always on the market. It's always tr uh, for sale. That's actually not a good thing, right? I mean, a really good property investment shouldn't come on the market very often because people are happy and they want to stay put. In the same way that if you see a house that's always on the market, you go, God, what is wrong with that house? Okay, so you would expect that if you're going to get an updated value for an unlisted property investment, you're going to need to get someone in and to someone in to revalue that asset at certain points in time. That's expensive, so we get people to come in every year, for example, and revalue the asset. So because it's appraisal valued, if you are nine months after the last valuation and you still have another three months to go until the next valuation, what's recorded as the value of that asset might be very different from the true value of that asset. Right, I mean, think about how quickly property markets collapsed in the GFC. Right? Within the space of about two months, what was recorded as a very high value of property, in some cases, would have halved. So you've got to, reflect, you've got to recognize the fact that what is recorded as value may not still be the value, which creates what we call investor equity concerns. And I'm going to come to that, I think, in the next slide. Private equity, same thing, right? You'll come and uh, you'll update the value of the private equity investments periodically. Remember that results in smoothed returns, understated risk, serial correlation, and understated cross-sectional correlation between asset classes. And if anyone can't remember the mechanics of how that works, remember I went through an um, Excel spreadsheet in the workshop of week four that showed how that worked for a direct property investment. So have a look at the numbers there again. There's often a lack of reliable indices, a lack of reliable data, and very few passive investment options available. So I've said basically everything except commodities and listed property. Let's think about data. What is an asset class, what is an alternative asset class that has a lack of reliable data? Think about what we're doing today. Infrastructure, there is basically no data, right? There's, I have not given you a line for infrastructure data that isn't a reliable infrastructure index I can use. So what I say is for the assignment, if you want to recommend infrastructure, uh, quantitatively, you could model it as a direct property investment, right? But it's obviously very far from perfect. All right, now let's think about indexes. Let's think about the alternative asset classes we look at in this course. 
And let's think about looking at an index, and there might be problems attached to that index. Can anyone think about an example here? Right, perfect. Yes, that's, that's what I was thinking of. Hedge funds, right? Remember, you can choose whether to disclose your returns if you're a hedge fund. So when you're gathering data to form a hedge fund index that shows hedge fund performance, you've got a higher proportion of better performers because the poor performers often choose not to disclose their returns. It would be negative marketing for them. Right? So that means that there's an upward bias in the hedge fund return series that we can see compared to the true population. There's also often a survivorship bias. Some hedge fund indices correct for this, others don't. Uh, but certainly when you come in and you first start an index, it's very hard to gain data, historical data, on the ones that have stopped existing because they're not around to ask for their returns anymore. So some of these indices, they only have data on the surviving funds, which again upwardly biases the returns. Passive options unavailable. Let's take private equity. Right? If you want to invest in a single private equity fund, and you're a big investor with a name and perhaps an existing relationship, you can. If you want to invest in eight private equity funds, you can in a single investment. What investment is that? How would you get eight private equity funds at once? So, does anyone know what it's called? It's a private equity fund of fund, right? You give your money to a private equity fund of fund manager, they take, they pull the money together and invest in a portfolio of private equity funds. So if you want eight private equity funds, you can. But think about the number of private equity funds that exist. A passive exposure would be to get a broad investment in a large proportion of existing private equity funds that is a representative sample of the universe. There's no way to do that, at least not yet. Hedge funds, same thing. You could get eight hedge funds through a hedge fund of fund manager, but there's no way to get the broad um, investment passively to hedge fund returns. That is a, a good, remember, in a passive investment, you need to be able to do nothing to, do, uh, to it. You can just leave it. And it is a representative investment of the underlying asset class. Right, so essentially you'd need a way to invest in all of the different funds or a large subset of them at once and not do anything with your investment. So it's not possible. That's actually related to the next issue, which is that alpha and beta tend to be quite tightly bundled. Think about equities. The first beta, what's the biggest beta factor in equity markets? The market risk premium, right? To be able to calculate the beta on the market, you need a market to use. You need index data or universe data. A lot of the asset classes don't have a reliable uh, index that's a representation of the broad asset class. So direct property, there is direct property indices, you guys use them, but they're actually not a particularly broad index, which makes it, you get an idea of what is direct property beta, but it's not actually as good as what you'd get in public equities. I mean, we even said last week fixed income indices are not a particularly good representation of the market. If there's problems with fixed income, there's problems with most alternatives. Uh, hedge funds, you could look at regressing hedge fund returns on the public equity markets. But the fact is hedge funds have a huge amount of flexibility. They're not restrained to only invest in equities. A lot of them invest in fixed income. They, have, they invest in commodities. They can trade in derivatives. They can leverage. They can short sell. So any of your standard asset pricing models like the CAPM, Pharma French, Carhartt, they actually do a really poor job of explaining hedge fund returns, which means they leave a lot left over to be classed as alpha, but there's actually still a lot of risk involved in what you're calling alpha from these models, but you're just not accounting for it because you don't have the right beta sources. So nowadays in hedge funds, there's a seven factor model, there's a nine, there's an 11 factor model, but even then, it's only getting a small proportion of explanatory power for hedge fund returns. So there's a lot called alpha in hedge funds that we believe is actually risk, but we haven't found the right way to measure it. The second you find it hard to split up alpha and beta, it's very hard to figure out the return due to risk and the return due to skill. 
In private equity, most of their performance measures return on uh, invested capital, like money you get, you put in versus money you get out, uh, internal rate of return, J curves. They actually don't adjust for risk at all. So, so far they're all issues, essentially. But the next one is one of the biggest assets, one of the biggest attributes of an alternative uh, asset investment. It's not the case in all alternatives, but it is the case in a lot of them. And that's economic value add. So be, in order to understand this, let's first start with the reverse. Let's say that you guys are active equity managers. You're running a mutual fund investing in public equities. You're really skilled. You were trained by ANU after all. You're really good at picking undervalued stocks and profiting from that. So you've done a lot of analysis, you've found your undervalued stocks, you've formed a portfolio of 20 of them. What do you do now? What do you do to realise your profit? Eventually, what will you do? Sell. Sell when they've gone up. What do you do in the meantime? Well, you, you could. Uh, uh, you couldn't. It, remember, we're a mutual fund, so you can't short sell. Hedging is difficult. But no, it, it's even more simple than that. The re I'm guessing you guys are thinking I have no idea what I'm talking about, right? The answer, yes, exactly. That's the point. There is no answer. You wait, right? You bought the undervalued assets. You have to wait till the market realizes and their value goes up. You're not running the companies. You're not sitting on the board of directors. You're not in the management team. You just need to wait and hope that that company doesn't do something really stupid in the meantime, or there's no royal commission or something that means that suddenly what was going to be a profitable strategy has gone down. You keep monitoring it, you keep updating the value, you keep looking at your overall strategy to check it's appropriate, but you're not affecting the companies themselves. Now you guys are private equity managers, you're general partners in a private equity fund, and you again are very skilled. So, general partners, you find your public equity investments. Let's say you've found a company that is currently publicly listed and you think it's inefficiently run by being publicly listed. Right? Ownership is too dispersed, it's not going through a good strategy, it sort of uh, hasn't changed much in a while, it, it's stagnant, the management team is poor. Essentially, they've grown very big and they've got very lazy. But you do like their underlying product. You think there's merit in the company if only it was run better. So what you decide you do is you undergo a leverage buyout. You borrow a whole ton of money, you purchase up the public uh, shares available, and you take that company private. Now, there are so many actions you can take. You might reposition it so it's got better access to debt, ma debt markets. You might fire bad managers and hire a new management team. You might get rid of underperforming divisions or products. You might change the marketing strategy to better promote the products you think are good. You might expand into new regions. You might decide that there's no point having physical stores. It's a drain of money. It's not where most of your revenue comes in. And you might move the company online. These are active decisions you guys are making that is going to create the value that will turn into your profit. Does that make sense? You are adding the value yourself by the actions you take. You're not waiting, you're doing. So if you're a good private equity manager, then you are able to have control over the value, as opposed to just hoping that the market realises their mistake and the company stays strong. Which means that you have a greater element of control, which in a way, if you're skilled, takes away a bit of that risk. So that will be the case in private equity. It will be the case in value-added property and infrastructure, which we're going to look at later today. Not typically the case in hedge funds, not typically the case in commodities. Right? In hedge funds, most of the time, not always, but most of the time, you're still uh, trading in public assets and waiting because you're not on the management team. It's a bit different, though, if you're dealing in something like distressed debt, right? uh, debt for control strategies. There you are having economic value add. But most of the time in a hedge fund, you're back in the world of waiting. Right? But if you do have scope for economic value add and you're skilled, that's a massive attribute. If you're not skilled, 
well, then you just know that you're the one that didn't manage to create value and destroyed all the returns for your investors. So skill really matters in a lot of alternatives. Back to the downside, they tend to have higher fees. So hedge funds and private equity in particular have a dual layer, oh, sorry, they have a dual layer of fees. And hedge fund of funds and private equity fund of funds have a dual layer of dual fees. Okay, so if we start with uh, just hedge funds and private equity funds on their own, does anyone know what the performance fee is typically in a hedge fund and a private equity fund? 20%. 20%. In a private equity fund, do you guys know what the average management fee is? It's 2%. Hedge funds used to also be about 2% management fee, but competition is increasing, and the average is now about 1.5% management fee. But that's, that's still a large percentage of the net assets under management just for existing. That's the management fee. And on top of that, you get a fifth of the profits. So what we're going to look at next week when we start with hedge funds is who really benefits from the hedge fund industry. Is it the end investor or is it the managers that are actually capturing a lot of the profits to be made? If you're in a hedge fund of fund, not only are you paying 1.5% management and 20% performance fee to each of the hedge funds, but you're paying your hedge fund of fund manager a 1% on average management fee and a 10% performance fee on top of that. So it's a very expensive way to invest. You want to make sure that the hedge fund of fund manager is very skillful. But on the plus side, remember what we said with private equity, for example, we said it's really hard to get access to private equity managers. And what we're going to look at soon is it's hard to pick good ones. A hedge fund of, sorry, a private equity fund of fund manager does that for a living. They are bigger because they're pooling the money of their different investors together, which means they find it easier to access the private equity managers and they spend their lives analyzing their returns, their performance, their strategies which means they should be able to pick better private equity managers as well. And then the other thing to realize is that they, a lot of these tend to come in listed and unlisted forms. And as we're going to see today, they can behave differently. So property can be unlisted or listed. Infrastructure, there's some listed infrastructure. It's not particularly strong yet, but it's there. Commodities, you might go and buy the physical commodity, or you might invest in a listed commodity like an ETF. Every, every so often, you can invest in listed private equity, but it's rare. A good example of that is Pantheon in the UK has listed private equity funds available. What's the big benefit of listed alternatives? Sorry, liquidity. Liquidity is a big benefit. Was that what, were you going to say the same thing, or is there an... There's, uh, yep, liquidity and continually updating the value, exactly, right? Because if it's, because you have liquidity, because it's traded, you know that that's being reflect, the value is being reflected in the price. Now, the caveat to that is the other issue with it being listed is it's subject to the whims of the market, right? If people, if the market's crashing and people want to invest in gold and government treasuries, then they might be selling their listed property investment to get them the cash to do it. It doesn't mean that listed property is bad. The value is going down because everyone's withdrawing their money from listed property, but that's not so much a reflection on the listed property investment as a reflection on the demand for gold and treasuries. Okay, so they are more subject to the whims of the market, but you are able to see a continually updated valuation, whereas when it's unlisted, you're going to see valuations with a lag. Okay, so obviously there are a lot of challenges when it comes to alternative investing. The reason that I've bolted the first two is to say that if you can't, and you consider these challenges for a specific asset class, if you can't overcome the first two challenges in that asset class, you are better off avoiding it. Because if you can't overcome the first two, you will end up in an investment that does damage to your portfolio. So find an alternative asset class that you can overcome the first two challenges, avoid the ones you can't. Now we've, we've actually spoken about most of this already, but the first one that is crucial is manager selection. Now the reason it is so important is that most alternative asset classes have quite a long horizon. Right? If you put your money in a private equity fund, on average, that money will be locked up for 10 years, 
You might get some back a bit earlier as investments are realised, but they typically have about a 10-year life. On top of that, they might have an extension option for another year or two or three. So when you put your money with a private equity manager, you're going to be stuck with them for quite a long time. There is a secondary market, but it's not liquid, and you, have, you typically take a discount to NAV if you sell. So you better hope you pick a good manager because you're going to be stuck with them for about a decade. All right, well, fair enough. You just pick a good manager, right? But how do you actually go about doing that? Because the fact is, if we stick with the private equity example, managers don't have to disclose all that much information, particularly to people that aren't already listed partners. Right? In terms of disclosing information to the public, there's not a lot they need to do. What they tend to do is give you a sample of representative deals. Right? Now, if you're going to pick, if you want to provide something that you want, to, you want people to see as a reflection of what you can do, you're not going to pick the bad investment that lost a lot of money. You're going to pick your good ones. It's marketing, right? So you can be pretty sure that the representative deals are not actually representative. They're upwardly biased. And the other issue is that people tend to play in private equity with how they report returns and therefore their ranking. Now, before I go into this, I'm going to ask you guys a question. And I'm going to count on you actually responding because it's only going to work if anyone, everyone genuinely promises me they're going to put up their hand, okay? Or not put up their hand depending on the answer. But don't keep your hands on your side because you don't want to participate. I need you guys to participate for this to work. It has nothing to do with investing, so you don't need to worry. There's no right or wrong. When you drive a car, it takes some level of skill not to crash, right? We've all seen the stereotypes of the bad drivers no one look at my car at the moment because it has a huge dent down the side because in trying to get out of my own parking space about two months ago, I managed to completely mount a pole. It looks, I'm getting it. It looks really bad. But, okay, you've got good drivers, you've got bad drivers. I'm going to ask you a question and you don't put up your hand if you're going to until I say go. The question, don't answer yet, is who here believes they are above average in their driving skill? Okay, wait. Hands up, go. Who thinks they're above average? You are not all participants. Okay, let me ask another question. Who here thinks they are below average in their driving skill? Oh, wow, you guys are really hard on yourselves. <laughs> this is ruining my example. I'm sure you're better drivers than you think. I really do. Okay, this test has been done um, in a lot of different carefully controlled psychological settings. And what they find is at least two thirds, if not three quarters of the population think that they are above average in their driving skill. They clearly need to try it in this room because the outcome might be different. But the fact is most people think they're above average. We can't all be right. Something fairly similar happens in private equity. And the reason is that studies have shown, independent studies have shown that top quartile private equity managers do outperform and create value for their investors. But that's therefore become a marketing slant in itself. Private equity managers want to call themselves top quartile. Because the second you say I'm a top quartile manager, people go, oh, okay, you're going to make me money, right? So what they do is they massage the figures. They look at, they pick the representative deals, the time period, the method of calculating performance. They pick the combination that works best for them so that what pops out in the ranking is a top quartile performance, but had they used perhaps a different time period or a different measure or a different set of sample representative deals, it might have been different. And the joke is that about half, I don't know if this is actually half, but certainly more than 25% of private equity managers claim to be top quartile. By definition, that can't be the case, right? So in private equity, you're going to have a lot of people saying, look at my wonderful representative deals. Also, I'm a top quartile manager. Doesn't mean you can believe them. So when manager selection is so important, it is a big issue that it's hard to find the good ones. Because the poor private equity managers have done terribly in their track records. So the first thing is, can you pick a good manager? Which is why I say fund, uh, private equity fund of fund managers can be advantageous. Yes, they have an extra layer of fees, but their whole business is picking and monitoring the right private equity managers. 
that you can identify a good private equity manager. The next issue, and I said this at the start of today, is gaining access to them. And remember we said that particularly when it comes to unlisted alternatives like private equity, like your non-core unlisted property that I'll come to later on, managers don't want to get a bunch of money from little people that they've never dealt with before. They want only a few investors to deal with, so they want very wealthy investors that will give them a lot of money that they know are good to come up with the cash when they ask for it, and ideally give them a bit of marketing too by having a big name attached. So if you can't overcome the first two challenges, avoid that particular asset class. And that is a reason why you might, and I'm not saying you have to, remember, please don't ever think I'm telling you what to do in the assignment. You might argue that you can pick a good private equity manager. But if you choose a zero private equity weight, your clients might want to know why. This is the type of thing you might want to consider, selection and access. If you do recommend a private equity fund, acknowledge that these are challenges, but you know, you're your own company. You can say that you have particular expertise in picking managers or uh, that you, you might recommend a private equity fund of fund, acknowledging the fees are higher, but saying that they can help you overcome those challenges, right? Again, you don't have to. I'm just thinking about the type of thing you might want to put into your argument. Everyone will differ because everyone will have different weights. All right, so let's say that you can overcome the top two. Now, alternative asset investing is feasible for the asset class. These bottom three aren't killers. They're not reasons to avoid the alternative asset class, but they are issues you need to keep in mind when it comes to implementing and monitoring the investment. The first is managing cash flows and asset weightings, and I'm going to stick with private equity for this example. Let's say that you raise a $500 million private equity fund and you close it today. Right? When I say close, it means that you've, got, you've now raised the full $500 million from your investors, so you'll close it to new investment, and now you're going to go about sourcing and implementing the private equity investments. I am one of your investors in the fund. You've closed it today. I've promised you $100 million. Do I give you that $100 million straight away? No. Instead, you don't, you don't want my $100 million until you know what you're going to do with it. Because otherwise, it's going to drag down your returns. Because what are you going to do with that money, right? What you'll do is you'll say, you've promised me $100 million. You keep it for now. As I find private equity investments, I will call up that money. So you guys might find one in three months and come to me and say, I need 20 of your $100 million today. Then in another six months, you might want another 80, or I, it's 100, another 40 million, and then the remaining 40 million might be caught up in year two. So when I'm trying to manage my own investment portfolio, that creates an issue for me because I know I've promised you $100 million, but I don't know when you're going to ask for it. I don't know how much you're going to ask for at any point in time. So when I figure out what to do with the money in the meantime, I've got $100 million that I've promised you. I don't know when I'm going to need to give it to you. So what am I going to do with it? I can't just put it under the mattress. Do I invest it in cash? Because it is liquid that way, but cash returns are really bad at the moment. Do I invest it in equities? But then that's quite risky because it's short term. And what if the market isn't doing particularly well when you're asking for your money back? Right? You've got all these issues you need to think of, and it's very... Remember how we said time frame is important? It's important to know what your time horizon is? Well, in this case, I don't know my time horizon because I don't know how long it will be till you want the money. I'll have a vague idea. I know it's going to be sometime in the next year or two, but it still makes it difficult to figure out what to do with the cash in the meantime. Once I've given you all my money, I don't get it back at one time. Right, because you might, imp you might buy your first private equity investment now and exit it via an IPO in six and a half years. So you'll give me some money back in six and a half years. You might exit the next investment in another six months, give me a bit more back then, and so on. So I don't know how much is going to be called, when it's going to be called, how much is going to be returned, and when it's going to be returned, which again makes figuring out what I'll do with the money on either side more difficult because the listed partner doesn't have control over that timing. Uh, so that's, so, sorry, I jumped to the second one. That's your cash flows. The first one is your asset weightings, right? So let's say you guys are running a fund and you have a maximum of 30% allowed in illiquid asset classes. You're currently at that maximum. 
And suddenly, your alternatives are doing okay, but the equity market goes down. You had a large weight in equity, let's say 40% in equities, you had 30% in illiquid assets. The equity market goes down, your illiquid assets stay the same in value. What happens to your illiquid asset weight? It goes up. Right? Even though illiquid assets haven't risen in value, equities have dropped in value, which means your weight in illiquid assets goes up. Suddenly, even though illiquid assets haven't changed in their performance, you've breached your mandate and you're now overweight illiquid assets. So you need to get back into mandate, you need to sell them. What's the problem here? They're, they're illiquid, right? They're, you, you might have a haircut, you might have a perm. So not only do you suddenly have to get back in within your mandate, but the very act of doing so is going to hurt your performance because you need to take a haircut on the sale. You might need to unwind some of those positions before they're ready. And worst case scenario, some of them might actually mean that you're stuck with a perm and you can't sell it. So you might not be able to get out of some of your illiquid asset classes at all, which means you'll need to reduce your weight in other illiquid asset classes to get back to your mandate. And that's drastically changed your asset allocation because you figured out not just your broad alternatives versus traditional asset class weights, but also how much you wanted in the different alternative asset classes. And because you've broached your mandate, you're now underweight one of your alternatives and overweight others because you can't sell some of them. Right, so that, that's another complication you need to remember. Currency hedging. A lot of alternatives originate overseas. You need to decide whether or not to hedge that currency risk. And if it's something like hedge funds, you might not even fully understand what your currency exposure is. We're going to look at that in week 10. And the last one, which is an important issue, is that most alternatives have lower governance quality than your traditional asset classes. Particularly when they're unlisted, they have less accountability, lower regulation, and because of that, they're less transparent. Right? Hedge funds don't need to disclose a lot of their strategies. They can choose whether to report returns. We've said the same thing uh, exists with private equity. Uh, if you've got an unlisted, uh, non-core, opportunistic property fund, same thing. So you've got to be aware of the fact that when you move into a lot of alternative assets, you're not going to have as much disclosure, so you're not going to have as Good, good an awareness of what is actually happening within that asset class. And the last one is that if you have an appraisal valued asset, there is this issue of a transfer of wealth between investors when you buy and sell. We call that investor equity concern. So let's say that you've put your money in an unlisted property fund. The last valuation was nine months ago and your property fund is doing very well. You want to sell now, the true value has gone up over the last nine months. But the listed value of this fund is nine months old. It's lower than the true value. So when you get out, essentially, you will receive too little compared to the true value, and the person that buys your stake will get in for cheap. They'll pay you too little to get in. So you're worse off, they're better off because the price is stale and the true value is higher than the recorded value. The reverse would happen if the, the true value has gone down. If you sell when the true value is lower than the stale recorded value, you receive too much, incoming investors pay too much to come in. Any questions about any of that? All right, so let's take a break and we'll come back in a couple of uh, minutes and start on our property investments. investment. Now, property can be broken up. We know it can be broken up between direct property and listed property, but we can actually break it up a little bit further, and that's where I want to start today. Now, remember, listed property is listed on an exchange and therefore traded almost like a share, which brings in liquidity. Unlisted property is not listed and therefore has illiquidity issues. 
There is, additional, there is an additional way to break down unlisted property, and that is between core and non-core investment. So there's a little bit of an overlap here, and I'll talk about it as we go through. There is unlisted and listed property. Then unlisted property can be core or non-core. Your listed property, your REITs, sits in between your core and your non-core unlisted property. And the reason it sits in between those two on a risk return spectrum is that your listed property, the REIT itself is listed, but obviously the REIT invests in a portfolio of properties. Within the uh, property portfolio of a REIT, most of it is core property, but REITs tend to have a small proportion that is non-core. So REITs will mostly invest in safe core properties. They will invest in a little bit of non-core, and that little bit of non-core moves them a little bit up the risk return spectrum compared to a pure unlisted core property fund. Okay, so think about it. Unlisted could be core or two different types of non-core. A REIT has mostly core, but a bit of non-core in it, which is why it sits at that point in the spectrum. I'll come back to that a lot, but it's sort of good to get your head around that before we start, because we always say listed versus non-listed, but your listed has a little bit of core, at, sorry, a little bit of non-core and a lot of core. And both of those, if you just have core, it's unlisted. If you just have non-core, it's unlisted. But a listed form could have both. So what we have here is sort of like um, a Markovitz modern portfolio theory line in that as you go up in risk, you go up in the return required to compensate. If we start at the bottom, we have core unlisted property. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to flick between these two slides because I don't want you to have to write it all down as I talk. I've got the definitions here, but we're going to keep coming back to sitting where it sits on the spectrum. Core is your safe, diversifying property asset. Right? It's what you would traditionally think of. Now, the other thing I wanted to remind you guys of, often when I say, what's the property market doing in investing, people will start talking about house prices. When we talk about property as an investment, we are generally referring to commercial property, not residential property. In your assignment, your investors have included their residential property as their direct property. But when we talk about accessing a direct property investment in the markets, we're talking about commercial property. So if you think about your classic commercial property, you're probably thinking about something like core property. That is your established, well-designed, well-run, well, uh, renovated property that is easy to lease out, is in a good location, and is therefore in high demand. A lot of people want to rent these properties for their business, which means you have, you can pick who rents it off you. So you'll pick a good renter that will give you a steady rental income stream. They will be happy there. They won't want to leave. You typically have long leases. When they do decide to leave, there's high demand for the property. So you will very quickly get in a new tenant. So you have low vacancy rates. And because you don't need to do a lot to these properties to make them rentable, in fact, they're typically ready to rent off the bat, you don't need to borrow as much as with your non-core property types. So leverage is low. Right, so this is your well-run office, retail and industrial commercial property investment. They, you'll have to buy, you'll have to pay a lot going in because they are good properties. And you might not get a lot of capital appreciation in that if the property market goes up, you will get an uptick if you sell it. But the real benefit of these, uh, of, of your core properties, is that they give you a steady rental income stream. And as a result, they can be quite a nice diversifying asset that gives you a constant stream of cash flows. That's even better if you are linking your rents to CPI because it's giving you an inflation hedge, not just in buying and selling the asset, right? because property is a real asset. So it will go up when inflation goes up. That's important, but in addition with core properties, you can have an additional inflation hedge through your rents because when CPI goes up, you can raise your rents as a result. Okay, so remember, the biggest asset class is public equities. Public equities do not do well in times of high inflation. So you've got a diversifying asset to equities that helps to hedge the inflation risk in one of the biggest asset classes in most portfolios. 
So that's your core property. Then you move up to your listed property. There's two types, REITs and REOPs, and I'm going to talk about those in a moment. But for this course, when we talk about listed property, we're typically talking about REITs, not REOPs. What is REIT? I'm not going to ask you that, it's written there. <laughs> REITs are real estate investment trusts. They're set up to invest in a portfolio of properties. Um, and the, the, the big thing about REITs is they need to pay out the vast majority, it's 90% of their cash flows, need to be paid out as dividends. So they're still going to give you a steady cash flow stream. REOPs are a bit different, but I'll come to that in a moment. So in REITs, as I said, you have mostly core property with all of the attributes that brings in, but you also typically have a small weight of your REIT invested in non-core. Non-core brings in risks, but also the scope for economic value add, or alpha. Because you have some non-core property, that will bring in more leverage, as we're going to get to in a moment, which of course makes it that bit more volatile and risky. And in addition, because it's listed, it will have a higher correlation with equity markets, particularly in the short term, and a higher volatility. The second an investment is listed, as I said, not only is the valuation going to be driven by its underlying asset class, it's also going to be affected by the whims of investors. People are happy, they have cash to spend, they're going to start buying, that might push the value up. Even if property itself isn't doing better, people are putting more money into listed markets because it's easy to buy a listed investment and that might bring up the price. They're scared, they might not be able to sell their unlisted property, but they can sell their REITs. So they sell them to get cash to invest in gold, it might bring it down, even if uh, the underlying property in a REIT is no worse than your unlisted property counterpart. You can sell the REIT, so you do, and it might bring the value lower temporarily. Okay, so short-term fluctuations are much greater in REITs. Partly that's because direct property is value appraised, but it's actually also because you have more noise in listed markets when you look at value. So it's going to have a higher correlation with equity in the short term in particular, which reduces its ability to diversify your equity risk. And remember the fundamental risk approach, equity is one of the biggest risks present in a portfolio, at least for your traditional super fund. So it does help to be able to diversify some of that away. That said, time horizon, and I will come back, it's written on a future slide, but time horizon matters. If you are a long-term investor, over the long run, the correlation between listed property and equity is lower than it is in the short term, because in the long run, listed property performance is more based on the underlying property market, which makes it a better diversifier in the long run than in the short run. All right, so the next two that you have are your non-core properties. Non-core property is where, within the property investments, there is scope for economic value add. Remember, that's where you drive the creation in value. So I've said at the bottom here, once you get into non-core in particular, the potential to generate excess return or alpha goes up, but only if you're good at what you do. So the importance of manager skill goes up as well. Remember how we talked about the challenges in alternatives and one of them was manager selection? Manager selection is not such a big deal when you're down in core properties because they're your safe diversifiers. You might get a return a bit higher than fixed income because you've got a risk a bit higher than fixed income. But once you have non-core, it is a much riskier investment strategy. You've got a much bigger spread of payoffs, so it's very important that you pick a good manager. Two types, value added first. That is your third um, when you, as we move up the risk return spectrum. And what you're doing here is you have an existing property. It is rentable, but only just, right? It, it is run down. There's a lot you could do with it. So you probably get to buy it for a relatively low price. But if you rented it as it was, you might not get a lot of rent. You might not get the best tenants. It's probably not going to be reliable. You might have quite a bit of vacancy. So what you tend to do instead is you buy it for relatively cheap and you upgrade it. You might refurbish it, give it a good paint job, uh, repair some uh, things that are broken if, if you need to. You might slightly change its use. You are changing the property, and in doing so, one, you're increasing its value if you want to sell it, 
and two, you're increasing its capacity to rent in the future. So once you've changed, once you've added the value to the property, the idea is it should then give you a better rental income stream if you decide to keep it, or you could sell it for capital, uh, capital appreciation if you decide to sell it. Now, obviously, that's not going to be a cheap process. So typically, value added has more leverage than core property because you need to borrow money to then upgrade it. There is a lower rental income stream at the start, although once you've upgraded it, you'd hope that you'd then have a higher rental income stream. And if you upgrade it well, you've got more capital appreciation than you do in core property because you've created value from your actions. Opportunistic takes it even further up that scale. Right? In opportunistic property, you're buying something for cheap because it basically isn't rentable in its current form. Right? It might be completely dilapidated with smashed windows. Uh, it might have caved ceilings. Uh, it, it's essentially impossible to get a rental income stream as it is. So you might need to knock it down and rebuild it. You might, need to do, you might need to completely gut the building and redo all of the internals. You might want to add on another wing. It might also be a greenfield development. You might buy a block of land and build from scratch. So these are the massive, massive changes. Does anyone here watch the block? I've only just started, I'm a, I, like I started watching on the weekend and I love it. I don't know how I've never watched this show before. But if you do what they're doing this season on the block with, I think they call it the Gatwick Apartments, that would be the residential version of opportunistic in the commercial space, right? Because there was nothing that you could do with those apartments when it first started. If you don't watch it, you really should. It's really addictive. <laughs> Except there's a lot of episodes, so it's also a bit of a time drain. Maybe wait until after week 12, then watch it. <laughs> Okay, so opportunistic property, you've got a huge amount of leverage because you, you're going to have to completely start a game, right? So you've got to borrow a lot of money and you, there's also a big spread of outcomes because you're taking a risk by taking on a property that no one else wants at the moment and hoping that you're going to change it so that everyone does want it so you can realise your return. Which means that what you tend to have is a high spread of outcomes. The good opportunistic property investments have made a huge amount of money the bad ones have lost a huge amount of money. So again, manager selection is critical. So there are your different types. The next thing I want to talk about is how you invest in each type, unlisted versus listed. Now, if you want listed property, you can do it through REITs, which is the focus of this course, or you could go through REOCs, real estate operating companies. We don't look at those in this course. They have a few features that make them a lot closer to equity, which means they're less good diversifiers and they're less reflective of the underlying property market compared to REITs. Right, in a REIT, you're setting it up to invest in a portfolio of income-producing properties, and there's quite a lot of regulations around what you can invest in and how you use the money. You need at least three quarters of the money in the fund to be invested in income-producing property and you need to pay out about at least 90% of the cash generated through dividends. You've also got a lot of requirements in terms of what you disclose. You're listed, right? So you have regulations involved. The, uh, a REIT is something like Simon uh, or Westfield. If you have a look at a REOC, that's something like Lendlease, if you guys are familiar with the company. You're, you have a lot more flexibility, you have a lot less regulation, you don't need to pay out the cash flows as dividends, you don't need at least 75% of your portfolio in properties, you can invest in developmental projects, you can invest in equity. So because of that, REOCs behave less like your standard property and therefore we don't really focus on them in the course because we're focusing on your property investments. So unless in fact, in this course in general, we're talking about REITs when we talk about listed property. If you want to invest in unlisted property, I've arranged these from what you'd invest as a small investor to a large, or what you can invest in as you go up in size. If you're a small investor, all you can really do with unlisted property is invest in a pooled vehicle. Because remember, commercial property is hugely expensive and you should be diversified when you invest in an asset class. So, I mean, I couldn't invest properly in one commercial property investment on my own, let alone get a diversified pool of properties. 
So what I would do is I would give my money to some kind of pooled trust or limited partnership or limited liability company. They would pool my money with a lot of other investors and then they would become of sufficient size to invest in a portfolio of properties. Typically pooled vehicles are core property, not non-core. When it comes to non-core, you don't have a lot of retail investors in that space. And it, there's a lot of work in terms of property syndicates and direct ownership in the, in the non-core direct property space. All right, so let's go up. Now let's say I've got, a bit, I've got more money behind me. I'm not an expert in property. I have a day job that isn't property investing, but I am very wealthy as an individual. Now I might have flexibility to invest, to persuade a manager to invest in property on my behalf and only on my behalf using a separately managed mandate. Right, so now I might say, okay, I want you to give me an investment that has two thirds of it being core property and one third being non-core, and I want it to have particular features, including a focus on hedging Australian inflation, say. They're experts, and they will go about executing that investment in a way that gives you a diversified property exposure. But I don't need skill myself because I'm putting money with a manager to do it. If I have a huge, a lot of money and knowledge of the property market and the time to oversee the investment, I might consider a property syndicate. That's when you've got a small number of very wealthy investors that pull together to then invest in a diversified property portfolio. It often has non-core property within it. But not only do you need a lot of money, you need to understand the property markets. You need skill and you need time to dedicate to it because you're not typically outsourcing to a manager, you're doing it yourself as part of a group. But at least it's not only your money and it's not only relying on your skill as opposed to direct ownership where an individual creates that portfolio alone. So you need, huge amount of, you need a huge amount of money to be able to get diversification. You also need a lot of time to oversee the investments and you also need a lot of knowledge to know which investments to make and how to, if it's, if it's value added property or opportunistic property, how to create the value. So typically, if you're a small retail investor, you will be sitting in a REIT if it's listed and a pooled vehicle if it's unlisted, and pooled vehicles are usually core property. So when it comes to figuring out what your property investment should be, you've got a lot of choices that you need to make. The first one is, do I want core or do I want non-core? Now, remember, core will give you a safe, relatively safe investment that will give you a steady income stream that often gives you an inflation hedge as well, but what it won't do is give you excess return. So if you want a safe diversifying asset with a bit of inflation upside, uh, protection, then you go core. But if you want alpha, you need to go non-core. You then need to decide, do I want listed or unlisted? And there's, no, there's a lot of trade-offs here. First of all, how much is liquidity important to you? Because if you really care about liquidity, you go listed, not unlisted. At the same time though, you need to ask how important is diversification? Is one of my key goals in investing in property to diversify my equity risk? And if it is, you've got to remember that REITs have higher correlation with equity markets than unlisted property, particularly in the short term, which would lend you towards a direct property investment if your goal is diversification. And closely tied into both of these is investment horizon. Because the issues with REITs being uh, more highly correlated with equities are more pronounced if you have a short horizon. But so are the benefits of REITs having liquidity, right? Because if you're a short horizon investor, liquidity tends to matter more, right? So if you have a short investment horizon, REITs will give you liquidity, but they won't give you as good an equity diversification. If you have a long horizon, REITs are liquid, but it's less of a big deal. And at the same time though, REITs do give you a better diversification from your equity over a long horizon. So arguably, over a long horizon, the difference between REITs and direct property is lower than it is over a short horizon, because it's more based on the underlying drivers of the property market. Scale and access. If you're a small investor, you can really, as I said, only go through a REIT or a pooled vehicle. 
REITs have the benefit of liquidity. Pooled vehicles have the benefit of diversification, but it might be a bit hard to get a good non-core exposure in a pooled vehicle. So if you want excess returns, that might also take you towards REITs because at least there's a small amount of value-added property within them. If you care about governance and transparency, that's stronger in listed property because you need to comply with listing rules. And more importantly, the last thing you need to ask is, does it need to be one or the other, or can it be both? Right? That comes down to the fact that listed and unlisted investments might actually be seen as complements, not substitutes. Right? Have, have a, a weight in listed and a weight in direct property combined. Now, there are a lot of reasons for that, and I'm going to go through it in the next slide. So I'll come back to why they might be seen as complements. Before I go on to local versus global, though, I just want to raise your attention to one thing in the assignment. Let's say you think that they're substitutes, and you think that direct property has a lot of issues, and you want to recommend that Abigail and Robert invest in listed property instead. I see this quite a lot. So let's say you say, all right, they both have a 10% weight in direct property. I'm going to tell them to change that 10% weight to listed property. You tell Abigail to do that, and she says, OK. You tell Robert to do that, and can anyone tell me what the problem with it is? And you'll need to look at the bottom of the page. Ah, now that's a good point when it comes to the investment strategy. You're right. So what's right for one might not be right for the other, right? One of them might be better off enlisted versus unlisted. It's the house. Like we're talking an actual mechanical issue here. If you tell Robert, I want you to get rid of your 10% in direct property and put it into listed, he's going to go, you want me to sell my home? Are you serious? What I have to rent now? You want me to leave Wallara? I love Wallara. Okay. If you're going to tell Robert to reduce that weight below 10%, you need to tell him how and you need to justify it. Because Abigail would just need to sell her commercial property stake. That's fine. If you reduce the weight to 5%, you're telling Robert, sell your $4 million house, buy a $2 million house. That might mean he moves out of Wallara. My best friend lives in Wallara. She is never leaving that suburb, right? She loves it. People get very attached to where they are in Sydney, right? So you need to justify why, and you need to tell him what to do. If you reduce it to zero, you need to tell him to rent for the rest of his life. Some people don't have a problem with that, but you need to provide a very good justification. Okay, so that is an, actually a constraint that you need to be careful of when it comes to Robert's recommendation. If you go up, that's fine. You can tell him, OK, increase it to 12%. That extra 2% might be in a pooled, unlisted vehicle. You might say, keep 10% uh, in unlisted property, leave that as it is, and then put a weight in listed property as well. That's fine. But if you reduce Robert's weight below 10%, remember to address what that means. Because so often in assignments, I see this happen and they don't address it, and your client would just freak out, right? because it's, it's just... It's a huge implication that you haven't actually addressed why or what he should do about it. Now, that said, Robert, not Abigail, Abigail's direct property is commercial, but Robert's direct property is residential. When we typically talk about implementing a direct property investment, we talk about commercial property. So that's actually, in a way, a nice diversification potential, because commercial and residential property don't always work the same. So you might say, up your weight in direct property, that's actually going to give you a bit of diversification within the direct property investment, because some's residential, some's commercial. All different options available to you. And you've also got to decide, do I stay local or do I go global in my um, property investment? Now, we're going to look at global investing in week 10, and there is a lot of advantages to investing globally rather than just within your domestic market. You've got more opportunity. You've got better diversification potential. Often there are overseas markets that are less efficient, so there's more scope for alpha. But direct property, or yeah, particularly direct property, is one of those areas where there is a big benefit to staying local and getting your global exposure from other asset classes. There's two things. The first is the inflation hedge aspect. Let's say that you guys are based in Australia, all of your expenses are in Australian dollars, 
and you're worried about inflation. You're worried about Australian inflation because that's what's really going to hurt you. If you're investing in overseas direct property, you're going to get an inflation hedge, but it's not actually hedging Australian inflation. It's hedging the inflation of that country, and they're not always highly correlated. Okay, so if what you care about is hedging the Australian inflation risk, it makes sense to invest in an Australian real asset like direct property. Right? You can peg your rents to Australian inflation, your capital appreciation will be a cor correlated with Australian inflation. The other one, particularly if you're in non-core direct property, is it's a lot easier to access and manage your investment when it's local. Right? Ideally in the same state, at least in the same country. I don't know if you guys watch Grand Designs, but invariably each season there's at least one episode where the people go, I'm not going to pay for a building manager, I'm going to do it myself. They also have a job, they often have a family, they're busy, they typically live in another city to where they're building, and suddenly it turns out they haven't accessed the site, they turn up, where there should be a bath, there's a door. Where there should be a pool, there's a tennis court. There's one less room than they think, and I don't know, the roof is a different material to what they expected, right? Because when you're not there to monitor it, mistakes happen. So if you're implementing a non-core property investment and you're driving the economic value add, you've got to be there, right? And you can't spend your time hopping between different countries. We live in Australia, we're ages away from anywhere else. You spend more time on a plane than on site. So because of both those reasons, when it comes to direct property, there is a big advantage to focusing on Australia. And that advantage, if you still want the overseas property, uh, sorry, if you still want the overseas exposure in your overall portfolio, keep the advantage of staying local and direct property and get your overseas exposure through your equities, where there's a massive overseas um, equity market that you can choose from. A lot of managers out there willing to manage the portfolios for you. Get it in direct property. Uh, sorry, not direct property. Get it in fixed income. Get it in private equity and in hedge funds where most of them are based overseas anyway and stay local in your property. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these because they're self-explanatory, but these are some of, and they're also in your readings, these are some of the sources of difference between listed property and direct property that make them good complements in a portfolio rather than substitutes. First of all, they're priced differently. Right? Listed property is continuously traded mark to market, which means that it has uh, quicker updates in the valuation, but it's also uh, exposed to market sentiment. Unlisted property is appraisal based, so it will reflect values with a lag. You've got different investor clientele, which means there's differences in supply and demand, demand in particular, right? Listed tends to be both uh, retail and high net worth individuals and institutions. Unlisted tends to be high net worth individuals, but not retail, and then also institutions. So the retail investors are in direct, uh, listed property, but not in direct property, which means that the uh, pricing in the two is gonna differ because the clientele differs. Your asset composition. Now here we're talking about two specific indices, right? You're listed, the biggest index in listed property here is the S&P ASX 300 A REIT. That index has more retail, some non-core and higher gearing compared to the biggest unlisted index, which is the Mercer Direct Property Index, where there's more office and industrial properties, lower risk, core strategies with lower gearing. Again, that means they're going to behave differently in their performance. They might have uh, differences in their risk return characteristics. Your unlisted property, if it is core, has very low gearing, less than 30%. If it's non-core, very high gearing, above 70%. Whereas your listed tends to be mostly core with a bit of non-core. So gearing tends to be in the middle, 30 to 50%. And obviously, the more gearing, the higher it will, the more it will amplify the volatility in your returns. Exposure to other business risk. Listed has more exposure to other business risk than unlisted, but we're really talking about REOX in particular here, which isn't a big focus on the course. So when it comes to exposure to other business risk, there's a little bit in REITs, but not that much. It's not a big issue in the context of what we look at here. But if you invest in a REOC, 
because they can invest in quite a broad portfolio of assets, including a lot of equity, then you're going to get exposure to business risks outside of property. Major source of excess returns in REITs, it's more about how you trade for what price and when. It's security selection and market uh, timing, whereas unlisted non-core property, it's all about economic value add. We know listed is more liquid than unlisted. And also, it doesn't seem like unlisted gives you much of an illiquidity, illiquidity premium, which is a bit of a shame. Access to managers, a lot easier, obviously, in a listed REIT. You just go and purchase uh, shares to the REIT on the exchange than in unlisted, where in the non-core space in particular, they tend to uh, favour your large existing clientele. Costs, cheaper for listed than unlisted. And unlisted has not just more expensive investment costs, but also opportunity costs. Because when you invest in an unlisted property, it is a long-term investment. And in the meantime, other options might come up that you can't access because you're stuck in a long-term illiquid investment that you might not be able to sell. Governance and transparency is obviously a lot higher for REITs because it's listed and therefore subject to more regulation. And we said, we've already talked about this last issue of investor equity implication. With REITs, it's continually traded, so uh, there's not that valuation lag. So when you buy and sell on the exchange, it will reflect the value better. But with an unlisted, you have investor equity concern because if it's been a while since the last valuation and you're selling out of the, the unlisted uh, property fund, at the price of the last valuation, you might, be paying to, uh, you might be receiving too much or receiving too little, depending on whether true value is above or below the most recent valuation. So all these things means that they're not always going to work in the same way, which means they can give you diversification. So if you, it all depends on what you want uh, in terms of how much of each asset class you want to invest in. If you care about diversification, you tend towards unlisted property because listed property has a higher correlation with equity, particularly in the short term. If you care about excess returns, that will move you towards non-core property because that's where the value add is and that tends to be unlisted. If you care about inflation hedging, you want it to be core because that's where you get the steady rental income stream that you can peg to inflation. And that's usually local if what you care about is the local inflation risk. And obviously, if you care about liquidity, you care about listed property, because that's much more liquid than unlisted. So that's our property. A lot of what we've spoken about here applies to infrastructure as well. What I want to focus on for the last bit of today is the, what, what I call the archetypal view, the rose-tinted glasses view of infrastructure, how the reality can differ and then go back to how there are similarities between infrastructure and property. All right, so let's start with that rosy... Any questions about property, by the way? All right, so let's start with the rose-tinted glasses view of infrastructure, why people love infrastructure, right? We've always got the new infrastructure prime minister, you know, this is the infrastructure century. We're future-proofing our lives by investing in infrastructure. People, it's so popular. Because people see it as a safe, stable asset class that is long-term in nature. But as I said, it has to be the right infrastructure project for these lovely attributes to apply. Now, by the way, when we talk about infrastructure investment in this course, we are not talking about social infrastructure. We are talking about economic infrastructure. Right? Social infrastructure is physical assets but they're used to support social services. So that's like your hospitals, your prisons, your schools. That is typically funded by the government. Economic infrastructure is used to support economic activity. And because of that, it has scope for what we call user pay systems. So that's things like your toll roads, your airports, your communications and your utilities infrastructure. They are typically funded by either private or PPPs, which is a private-public partnership. So we're talking about investing in infrastructure that has scope to generate a series of returns. So that's economic infrastructure. I'm going to use exa the example of a toll road to illustrate the archetypal view of infrastructure because this, that's one of the first things people think of 
um, when they think of infrastructure as an asset class and why it can be so attractive. So the first thing people think about is that they are long-lived assets. So you take a toll road, if you build a toll road, you might have the right to operate it for the next 100 years, which again is why it's quite attractive to superannuation funds because they also have a long time frame. The next thing you tend to think about is that it's capital intensive, but operating costs are low. If you build a toll road, if you build something like the M5, it will cost you billions of dollars to construct it. But once you've done it, the, the ongoing maintenance and operating costs are pretty low. You might fix the odd pothole. You might upgrade the toll booth, right? In the M5, you can't use cash anymore to pay tolls. They've changed it. But there's not that much that you need to spend on an ongoing basis to keep upgrading a toll, uh, to keep the toll road in operation. There's typically high barriers to entry for a few different reasons. One of them is that it's a natural monopoly, but I'm gonna come back to that in the next point. Another is that there's a lot of regulation barriers that you need to go through to actually start up an infrastructure project. It takes a lot of time, it costs a lot of money, you need accountants, you need lawyers, which means that there are barriers to entry, which is gonna reduce the pool of people that wanna actually invest in an infrastructure project. There's also very high capital costs. Right? Like I said, if you're gonna build a toll road, it will cost you billions of dollars. There's not that many potential investors when you're looking at billions of dollars up front. When there's high barriers to entry, that means that it tends to be natural monopolies, right? And when it's a natural monopoly, you can get higher profits than when it's a competitive market, right? Think about the M5. If I came to you and said, I've got a fantastic infrastructure idea. We're gonna build another express road from Canberra to Sydney right next to the M5. Why? What's the point? You've already got the essential service. A lot of infrastructure, you need a service once you have a single project that creates that service, there is no more opportunity. Build a toll road somewhere else, but we don't need a second M5 next to the M5. The M5 is fine, right? So that's why you, it tends to be a monopoly in that space. For a long time with communications, Telstra had a monopoly because of the copper wire network. That's changing now though, obviously, because we've got the NBN. But when it's a monopoly, it means that you can command stable cash flows and those cash flows can be quite high. They're also, the cash flows are also stable because they tend to be essential services. When you're in a recession, you're not gonna not take the M5 to get to Sydney. You still need to be on the M5, you're still gonna need to pay that toll. Right? You're still gonna need to call people. So communications infrastructure is still relatively stable. You might dial back on your overseas calls, but you're still gonna typically need to use it. When you're in a recession, most people will still pay for electricity for your heating in the winter, right? You do have people that go, no, 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 I'm not gonna heat my house, but it's relatively rare. When it's essential, you're gonna have stable cash flows that provide you with a bit of an, a um, recessionary hedge or a hedge against equity market fluctuations. Revenues are often linked to inflation. So you might have in your contract that you can link your tolls to CPI. That gives you an inflation hedge. People tend to think that infrastructure projects have a low correlation with equities and are therefore defensive. That's what I said before, right? You're still gonna take the M5 to get to Sydney, even if you're in a recession. And people tend to say that with all these benefits, the two key risks tend to be changes in the discount rate and regulation. The discount rate being that, remember, the value of an asset is its present value of future cash flows. So even if the cash flows are stable, if your discount rate is changing, your value changes with it. And you might have a regulatory environment that creates a natural monopoly that gives you stable cash flows, and then the government comes in and deregulates the sector, and your natural monopoly disappears. That happened with Telstra many years ago. So this is the rose-tinted glasses view of infrastructure. It looks like a really attractive asset class, and it can have every one of these benefits but they don't all have these benefits. Even within toll roads, a bad toll road will not create the same returns, the same inflation hedge, the same defensive asset that a good toll road will do. Okay. 
So this is the truth of infrastructure. This is how it can differ. First of all, there's a diverse set of assets with their own exposures and drivers. Toll revenue will behave differently to communications revenue, for example. The second is that cash flow risk can and does exist. You have construction and development risk. A great example of this I'll talk about in a moment, uh, and that is that uh, one of the assets a company called Transurban invested in is the Burnley Tunnel in Melbourne. Now, when they built the Burnley tunnel, tunnel, bits of it obviously were built on sand, and as the sand started to shift, cracks appeared, which meant that water was getting in, and it looked like they would have had to, had to do the, redo the whole section. They actually managed to repair it. But things can go wrong when you're creating these massive infrastructure projects. Not all infrastructure is regulated and monopolistic. Or you might have, like communications in Australia, what was a natural monopoly, then the government changes the rules, they change regulation, and you lose the natural monopoly and competition comes in to hurt your profits. Not all uh, uh, infrastructure uh, gives you a hedge against economic risk. Right? For example, you might still take the M5 to get to Sydney, but you might take less overseas holidays, so your airports might be exposed to the economy. You might not take the cross-city tunnel, particularly in a recession, because you don't want to waste the money. You don't always have a mandated inflation link, and if you can't increase your user pay stream in line with inflation, it's not going to give you an inflation hedge in the same way. If you have a listed infrastructure investment, you have a higher correlation with equities, particularly in the short term. So that removes that lovely ability of infrastructure to diversify and act as a defensive asset. It's often considered safe, but you can have extreme leverage in a pro project. And if you have extreme leverage, it will amplify your payoff structure and create risk. And it is still a relatively new asset class, particularly as an investment vehicle. So people are still going through learning curves. Mistakes happen. The Cross City Tunnel is one of them. So you can actually lose a lot of money in infrastructure as people are still feeling out how to forecast revenues reliably. I mean, the Cross City, City Tunnel looked really profitable before it was built, but it turns out the people that projected the usage got it completely wrong because it wasn't an essential service like they thought. So people just zipped around it. Now, that said, it does have parallels with property. It has similar choices, issues, and roles. And a lot of the things that we talk about in the property slides, like these choices, they do affect infrastructure as well. But there are some differences with property that are important to be aware of. One of them is that there's less homogeneity, right? Different types of infrastructure behave very differently to each other. And there's also lumpier investment. It's really expensive to start up a new infrastructure project, much more so than with property. And the costs through time can be different depending on what the project is. So you've really got to be, take a case-by-case -case approach when it comes to your infrastructure. The large scale, it's a lot larger in scale than property, which means that it rules. There are some investors that are just big enough to invest in property, but not big enough to invest in infrastructure. And listed infrastructure has more problems than listed property, right? I mean, listed infrastructure is easier to access than unlisted infrastructure, but it also has a higher correlation than unlisted infrastructure, which is similar to listed property, right? So, but then you go, well, hang on. If you're choosing between listed infrastructure and listed property, listed infrastructure is less well diversified, plus it has the same problems as listed property in terms of higher correlation with equities. So listed property is more popular than listed infrastructure because it gives you a diversification to an extent with equities, particularly in the long term, but also has more diversification within that investment vehicle. Right? Listed infrastructure tends to be quite a narrow concentration of investments. So with infrastructure, size really matters to make that investment worthwhile. So the last thing I wanted to do is I wanted to take you through two examples of, an, of infrastructure projects. And I probably won't get all the way through this. I'll finish the example uh, in the, at the start of the workshop. But just to start us off on this slide, the focus of this slide is to show you straight away 
that infrastructure doesn't always conform to the archetypal view. We've got two infrastructure investments. We've got Transurban and Macquarie Infrastructure Group. And we've got their performance through time. First of all, let's have a look at their standard deviations. Remember how infrastructure is supposed to be low risk? Well, Macquarie Infrastructure has nearly three times the risk of the ASX 200. Transurban has double the risk of the ASX 300. So they're not really low risk asset classes. But that shouldn't matter as long as you can diversify that risk away. So don't focus on standard deviation, focus on beta. All right, here Transurban has a low beta. So now you're starting to see the diversification potential. But Macquarie Infrastructure Group has a beta of 0.73. That is a very high beta for something that's supposed to diversify your equity risk away. And the third is have a look at the chart here. Remember, infrastructure is supposed to be defensive. Look at what happens in 2009. The black line is the S&P ASX 200, sorry, not 300. When the market crashed in the GFC, so did Transurban and so did Macquarie Infrastructure Group. So it is not as defensive as they'd like you to be. And both these companies are set up to invest in toll roads, the most classic infrastructure